Devil Country by David Hardy Chapter 12 Heinrich had never heard devils sing before he sat down to dinner with them that night. He didn't realize they had the capacity. The ones in the camps or abroad at war barely made a sound in their day-to-day -day doldrums beyond the necessary affirmative words to their handlers. While they fought, it was a different story, and the loud buzz of a devil leaping across the battlefield towards a doomed target had become a terrifying symbol of the power held by Crestland, but certainly could not be called musical. Heinrich never realized how odd this was. Human slaves, like songbirds, created beautiful music in captivity. The devils, however, did not. Yet here, sitting around the massive bonfire, the songs of the devils were loud and raucous. Heinrich couldn't hope to follow along, unable to understand or pronounce the words. The sharp whistles nearly hurt his ears, and the thrumming clicks of the words beat a steady rhythm in his chest. Most of the devils accompanied themselves with the cricket songs they could make by rubbing their forefingers against their thumbs, but one devil had brought out a fiddle and was playing it hard and fast. Heinrich, who knew how to play the violin badly, noticed that the devil played while sitting, laying the instrument over his knee and running the side of his hand across the strings instead of a bow. This gave the sound a strange quality. Heinrich was content to sit next to Oliver and just take in the bizarre and strangely pleasant chorus of whistling, chirping music erupting all around him. "'Do you know these songs?' Heinrich asked the young devil, whose look of astonishment rivaled Heinrich's. "'There was no singing in the camp. Why is that? This is all so astonishing!' Father says our ancestors were both hunter and hunted. When they lived in caves, they only sang when they were safe. But you're safe in the camps, aren't you? You have beds, you have meals. There are no predators coming to get you. Oliver paused before looking back to the devils around the fire, celebrating the return of their lost ruler. They danced, too in great lanky rhythms, flailing their arms this way and that. Some devils paired off, clinging intimately to one another as they spun around the fire while other devils cheered them on. The affair resembled most of all a whole hive of honeybees swarming merrily around a bright orange flower of flame. "'We don't have freedom,' said Oliver. "'People don't need freedom to sing,' insisted Heinrich. "'Ours do.' said a sudden voice from above Heinrich's head. He was startled for a moment as he looked up and saw an unfamiliar devil holding a hank of lamb with bloody tufts of wool still attached. The devil dropped the lamb chunk into Heinrich's lap, prompting a pitiful scream, saying only, The President says eat, before walking away. Heinrich shuddered at the bloody lamb shank, now staining his clothes red. He looked over at Oliver, and the young devil looked sympathetic. We like our meat raw. I know that, you silly boy, snapped Heinrich, before his face fell into an expression of utter helplessness, looking down at the lamb in his lap without a clue of what he was supposed to do with it. Would you like some help cooking that over the fire? suggested Oliver. Heinrich was about to snap at the boy again, but looked from him to his lap, and then back to the boy, before he nodded slowly. I... I would appreciate that, yes. He's lying, insisted the minister, between bites of meat as he sat upon a throne his people had carved for him out of the trunk of a tree. His antenna had been burned somewhat by the chemicals in the laboratory, but his eyes were fine, if a little raw-looking. He must be. All of them lie, and especially lie in their own interests. Leonard was standing nearby the minister, watching as his son and the prince carefully set down some logs by their bench to set up a cooking fire. Oliver was showing the prince how to use flint to set kindling alight, and the prince was succeeding in catching his thumbs between the stones and cursing loudly in pain. "'I think you give Heinrich too little credit, minister,' said Leonard. "'If he saw humans in the woods, and he is so self-interested as to lie about it, why not simply go with the human knights and be rid of us? Perhaps he was the one who sent them here, and we're all walking into his plot. We aren't all weaving plots, minister. <laughs> well, you should be, the devil said with a laugh. 
He finished his meal by placing the cracked tip of the bone he had been chewing on past his mandibles. He sucked out the marrow before tossing the shards behind him. He then wiped his fingers on a kerchief laid daintily over the arm of his chair. The handkerchief was strangely fine for a camp in the woods, but Leonard thought it was quite appropriate for the minister. "'In any case,' continued the minister, "'aren't you going to eat? I saw you had your eye on a particularly fine piece of... oh, I can't figure out how to pronounce what the humans call it. The ones that are all fluffy and white and go ba ba. I sent it to Heinrich. He needs his strength for this. You show him far too much kindness, but I'll say no more. Leonard changed the subject. I'm surprised you're not more concerned about the missing vial of that abominable chemical. You seemed in such a fit earlier. I'm not so fragile that a single setback will cripple me. We saved nearly everything, and the humans were too stupid to take the real prize. They don't have an inkling what a starship is. They believe the sun and stars are hanging in the sky like a spinning curtain. Mercy! See? Idiots all! Our people believed something similar, too, once upon a time, said Leonard softly. Yes, and that shows that these humans as a species are nothing more than backwards children. It's one thing to be enslaved by some terrifying spacefaring conquerors far afield of our solar system, but to be enslaved by a people who seem to have barely come out of their caves and invented fire? The minister trilled in merry laughter at his own joke, before he went on, ignoring Leonard's sour looks. It was definitely a knight from the Castle Novem, by the way. It wore the Novem standard. Then they are looking for him. I should have left when I had the chance. Too late now. They probably think you're in league with us, said the minister. His voice then lowered and became almost hopeful. Speaking of which... The minister let the phrase hang in the air, and Leonard couldn't help but look away. Every moment with the minister weighed more heavily upon his patience. Despite their history together, he had come to see the minister as the worst of his race. But a part of Leonard was glad to see a familiar face after thirty years. Before he could turn towards the devil and confront the lingering question in the air, he noticed that Heinrich and Oliver were approaching. Heinrich, with his blood-stained robes and sooty fingers, did not look happy or well, but he did look fed. He had eaten his fill and given the rest to Oliver, who was eating the cooked meat with a measured curiosity. He didn't dislike it, per se, but he thought that cooking one's meat seemed like an acquired taste. Leonard, began Heinrich, while I appreciate the hospitality of these renegades, I must ask, when are we going to leave? I must arrive at the castle near them. Soon. The sooner the better, in fact. Heinrich looked quite relieved. But the minister clearly did not appreciate this answer. Oliver looked from the minister to his father curiously as he chewed on the tough, cooked lamb. Your honor, began the minister, you have seen what we have here. Yes, and I'm very happy to find out what you've been up to after all this time, said Leonard, allowing the scent of sarcasm to color his words. It was a pleasure to find you well, so-called minister, but Lord Heinrich and I must be leaving if we want to arrive at the Castle Novem. They will kill you on arrival now that you've been seen with renegades. And a child outside of Greyville. Mercy me. Oliver spoke up. Kill? Why would they kill you, father? Hush, little one. I... And for that matter, continued the minister, turning his gaze from the suddenly frightened boy to his abashed father, the little lord here will certainly give away the position of our camp give away our numbers, tell what we had in my little lab. Each word from his lips is a dagger in the back of all these people, who are throwing you this bash because they believe you've returned to save them. No, I... began Heinrich, but the minister cut him off. Don't deny it, human. As soon as you were past the castle wall, you would give us away within a blink. It's just your nature. Do you deny it? Heinrich wanted to say that he did, but his moment's hesitation spoke more volumes than any refutation could. Leonard, said Heinrich, I... I have my duty, Lord Heinrich, said Leonard, 
his voice quavering enough that even Heinrich's untrained ear could detect it. "'You've got no loyalty to me, Leonard,' said Heinrich. "'What's all this about duty?' "'You've already forgotten,' answered Leonard as he withdrew the totem from his pocket. "'You gave me this.' He opened his fist, and all present saw the gift that the human had made for the devil, the little wooden chest knight, with the finely carved mane and eyes, sat in Leonard's palm. Oliver looked at it in fascination, the minister with sneering contempt, and Heinrich with confusion, all mixed up with shame. But that was— said Heinrich, before he stopped and started again. I never— I'm ready to do whatever you feel best, Lord Heinrich. But what he said about— You cannot listen to what the minister says, Heinrich. He can't be trusted. Oh, that's right, human. You should disregard everything I say. So— "'Lord Heinrich,' continued Leonard, "'what do you want?' "'At this, every eye turned towards the prince. "'He took a step back unconsciously. "'It was up to him? "'He, Heinrich of the ledger book, "'who had never raised a sword "'but could wield a treasury report "'with such deadly accuracy. "'He, with no ambition, "'no wish to rise in station, "'and only a vague hope that the Lady Eileen "'was as beautiful as he'd heard to carry him through?' He seriously doubted that he was qualified to be making such a decision. He knew that the day before he would have taken Leonard at his word at the first opportunity. But if leaving now would not only put Oliver and Leonard in danger, but also the renegade devils who sang and danced with such ferocity, he wasn't sure if he wanted to be responsible for that much death. I, he said, after a moment's thought, I think it would be best if we stayed. Leonard seemed genuinely shocked. Truly? Heinrich knit his brows together and snapped at Leonard. Don't be so surprised. Useless loss of life is, well, useless. You, uh, you're all far more valuable alive. So Duke Novem's inquisitors might extract the information about your alchemy from you. The minister laughed. Well said, you vicious little brute. Bravo. Leonard placed the chess knight back into his pocket, slowly. It was clear even to Heinrich that he was smiling. As the totem disappeared into Leonard's robes, Oliver followed it with his eyes, burning with curiosity. "'You are welcome here as long as you like, Your Honor, and your guest, and son as well,' continued the minister. "'I even have a little suggestion for how we all might keep busy.' "'What is it this time?' "'Well!' The minister stood suddenly, putting his arms behind his back and pacing around Leonard in a wide circle. I must ask, Your Honor, what was your plan at the camp at Greyville? My plan? Yes. Surely you had some kind of plot, some escape, some subversion you could enact from within? I... began Leonard, his gaze flitting from Oliver to the minister as his antenna drooped. I did once. But no more? When my son hatched, I did not feel comfortable moving against the humans. I was content to try to make life as comfortable as I could for the others in the camp. Ah, soft. I knew it, gloated the minister. In that case, you know firsthand the destitution of our people. The slavery, the cruelty, the war games— Perhaps now that you have the time and the resources here, I might propose a solution. Before Leonard could respond, the minister leaped up onto his tree-stump throne and made a loud buzzing cry. All of the songs and merriment around the bonfire stopped in an instant, as all faces in the camp turned to look towards their leader. My renegades! My people! My brothers! He said. I've been discussing with our returned president, and we have come to a decision. A decision, said Leonard in a harsh whisper. Minister! However, the minister did not give Leonard an opportunity to interrupt him. We have fuel for the mothership, and we intend to use it. You are all, from this moment on, part of a citizen militia, made up of every one of our kind left on this planet. You have been rallied under the rule of our glorious president for the freedom and glory of all. 
Leonard tried to cut in then, saying he agreed to no such thing, but the roar of the crowd drowned him out easily. He tried to roar over it, but realized it was impossible. He and I have been discussing, and we believe the best way to help you all is to arm ourselves with as many weapons as we can make operational, launch a full-scale attack on Greyville to free our enslaved kin, and then march upon the castle, Novem, and fight until they relinquish the dropship. Deliverance from slavery is at hand! I gladly step down from my position as your leader, in order to give it to the one who owns it by right, the true president of our people. Leonard tried to contradict the minister, but the adoration of his people, and even worse, the adoration in the eyes of his own son, was so great that he could not escape from it. He was trapped in the role of the hero. The only eyes that did not hold admiration were Prince Heinrich's, who instead wore an expression of pity and understanding that sat strangely on the haughty prince. As the two of them looked into one another's eyes, a moment of understanding passed between them. Heinrich knew exactly how terrified Leonard was at that moment, and Leonard was glad to have at least one soul who knew his true feelings.